right, well, welcome everyone to today's workshop on actionable strategies to combat subscriber churn and increase your customer LTV. Just to give yourselves a little bit of an introduction here, my name is Rachel Quick. I have been helping customers with their subscriber retention strategies at Recurly for 10 years now and serve as the Senior Director of Customer Operations. And hi everybody, I'm Paul Chambers, one of the co-founders and CEO of Subta, the Subscription Trade Association. I've been in subscriptions for over 23 years as a whole, last in the D2C space directly in the last six years, uh, helping build companies such as Gentleman's Box and Capsiva and helping found the Subscription Trade Association and our conference, the Sub Summit. So I'm really excited to be here with you today, Rachel. Thanks so much for uh, having me on this and, and doing this with us over here at Subta. Absolutely. We see a lot of really great customers here at Recurly, so I'm excited to share what we see uh, merchants do. Yeah. So let's kick things off. Uh, before, as we start, we're going to go into a little bit of basics just to get everyone on the same page. So we'll talk about uh, customer segmentation, differences between retention and churn. Uh, we'll go through some case studies with one of my favorite subscription boxes. We'll talk about some automation that can help you manage these things without uh, distracting you from your core business. And then finally, I'll cover some legal considerations and risk considerations for you as a merchant. So let's start out with a foundation on customer segmentation. Uh, through the course of this workshop, you'll hear me reference B2B and B2C. So B2B is business to business. So for example, Amazon Web Services selling to Recurly. Um, as we talk about customer notifications, it's important to realize that B2B typically has more internal process. So you want to give them a longer period of time to pay their bill and probably less emails. And that's because they're typically routing through accounting or finance and it just needs a little bit more time. It's also important to note that B2B is more likely to pay, especially if your product is mission critical. So again, this is another audience group that you really want to give more time to because you don't want to pull down the service if it's something critical to their business. Typically, B2B companies are using direct applications with people signing in every day. So it's best to communicate dunning uh, with in-app messaging rather than emails that might get buried. And really, again, that mission critical function, shutting off their access should be a last resort. We also work with a lot of B2C companies and a standard example that everyone is familiar with is your Netflix subscription. In these cases, it's important for a company like Netflix to send more emails over a shorter period of time. And really, these are designed as luxury items. So customers are less likely to pay if it's not necessarily mission critical. Although in my case, having a Netflix subscription for my nine-year-old home from school. Definitely, definitely mission critical. Mission critical. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, shutting off access is a great prompt for payments. So sometimes they will just wait until that very last second to pay. And when you can't log into that Netflix account, that's when they go ahead and uh, submit updated payment information. So as we look at churn, there's another couple of sets of key terms to keep in mind, voluntary versus involuntary churn. So voluntary is really that. The customer is just deciding that they do not need the product anymore. It could be based on the value of the product, um, whether or not it's affordable, or maybe the trial period just didn't prove the time to value. So it's really the customer opting out of using the product. Alternatively, uh, there's all, uh, involuntary churn, which is really a problem with the customer's payment information. And this is where a lot of automation can help recover those customers. So let's talk a little bit about the importance of that automation. One of the great things about subscription businesses is that once you've gained a customer, you've gained them for life. So keeping in touch with that customer, making sure they're getting value, that's important for keeping them engaged and keeping them renewing their subscription every, every month or every year. Renewals do take a lot of time. Um, it's, it's time to process and make sure that they're billed correctly. So making sure that they're automated is really key to your business and making sure your finance doesn't take over your key business model. And when you're thinking about um, you know, what you're going to do with your customers in terms of preventing that involuntary churn, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Um, this is exactly what companies like Recurly are out here for. Um, we have spent years 
gathering data from millions and millions of transactions, knowing the best times and days to retry transactions. We have familiarity with uh, car brand regulations in terms of how many times to retry and what error messages can be retried and shouldn't be retried. So you can depend on services like Recurly so that you don't have to maintain this code. I have a question here now with voluntary churn, you know, there can be a variety of different reasons, whether they got, you know, subscri- subscription box, we call it box burnout, or uh, they're just, you know, getting too much, you know, or, or gift or things like that. Do you guys track, are you tracking that data? Or are you seeing any trends in voluntary churn uh, side of things? Yeah, you know, it's it's funny with a lot of our B2C companies, especially, I, I see a lot of mm-hmm. six month burnout. So um, typically right around that six month mark is where you see customers start to lose interest. And so one of the strategies I've talked to merchants about is to keep an eye on their cohort analysis, try to figure out, you know, what month are they starting to see the most voluntary churn? And preempt that, whether it's a coupon, whether it's a discount or credit, or even just, you know, a quick email reminding them of the value. Um, usually that that data around where the subscriber burnout point it's is. It's a great idea. Really Actually, good. something I hadn't thought about and sometimes is an email reminding them of the value. And, and you don't need to make it blatant and obvious, like, don't forget, you're getting this much value out of this this subscription here. It's It's just kind of showcasing some of the products or showcasing, you know, the different benefits of the subscription, right? You think those are ways that you could do that? Absolutely. And, you know, it's not always burnout. Sometimes it's just, um, especially with subscription boxes, they can stack up. Uh, in the closet over to my right, I have about 10 uh, boxes of kid activities that we just haven't gotten around to. And so one of the strategies that works really well with subscription boxes with physical goods is to give your customers the ability to pause and to just say, you know what, maybe I'm you know, just like a newspaper, maybe I'm going on vacation and I want to pause the newspaper. I'm not leaving, but just give me a little bit of a break. And that's a great retention strategy to keep them in the system, you know, get their billing back up and running at some point in the future, but allow them to have that little bit of a break. So um, in terms of talking about retention strategies, I want to talk about one of my favorite subscriptions. And um, this one I'm so in love with. I actually have two accounts with them because uh, they limit the number of books you can get each month. So I maintain two email addresses and two accounts. Um, So the company is Book of the Month. Um, I'm a big reader, as you can probably tell behind me. And um, this is one of those subscription products that's really gotten it right. Um, The best thing they do is they make you feel a little bit special. So we've got this book of the month BFF club. And uh, I'll tell you logging in every month. uh, I really wanted to check these boxes. You know, this is like one of those reward stamp cards. I really wanted to get to that that point where I was a BFF and it definitely pushed me to order more books. So is it like the like a LinkedIn thing where you log in and it's like, you've got 90% of your profile complete? Yeah, it's that whole gamification, right? People really love to have a progress bar and to feel like yeah, they're working Yeah, because it feels, you feel like, oh man, I'm not 100% full. What, what can I do to help fill that up? And, and it's that sense of completion then too, when you get that. Wow. Exactly. And you love it so yeah. much there too. I love that. It's a lot of reading, Rachel. Yeah, it's, it's a lot of reading, yes. And, uh, you know, not only do they make me feel like I'm, you know, special BFF, but they constantly remind me of the value I'm getting from their service. So again, I'm big into gamification. I'm one of those people that has to complete my LinkedIn profile to 100%, as Paul mentioned. So when I can log in and I can see my stats, it's so cool to think, okay, I joined four years ago. I've gotten 52 boxes from them. And this is just one account, right? I've read almost 10,000 pages. That is really exciting. Um, And maybe it's just because I'm a book nerd and, you know, at the end of the month, my friends and I compare how many pages we've read, but it's really nice to have these stats right in front of me and to be able to share and see the value. Exciting and impressive. Like, because mine would say like 10 pages, (laughs) not (laughs) 10,000. 
So they do a lot of other fun things. I mean, this isn't just about, you know, a BFF club and, and stats, but they do a lot of work to sort of surprise and delight their customers. So first and foremost, they uh, celebrate your birthday. You get an extra book on your birthday. And, you know, it's not a huge value. It's, it's $10, but they are giving you something free. They're acknowledging a special day for you. It helps me appreciate the business and remember why I'm a subscriber. They also do an annual book of the year. And so uh, each member of book of the month gets to vote on what book of the year uh, they would vote for. And then uh, you, will get a f you will get to choose from one of the finalists at the end. So you get a free book then. And again, it's like you have this incentive to participate in the survey and then they return that value to you with a free book. So um, they do a lot of great things. This is a great subscription. They're not a customer of mine. They're just a subscription out there I love. So definitely um, check and them out. They're doing something you. that, you know, a lot of subscription boxes, it's kind of, in, in some cases, the either or, where they're either replenishment or discovery and delight. They're, they're able to accomplish both, which is really neat. It's great. Um, you know, part of that whole uh, completion aspect is uh, they give you five books to choose from every month. And you get that discovery of like, oh, there are five really great books here. I kind okay. of want to read them all. Um, so they really incentivize you to like load up that box and, and pick a lot. So it's, they've, right. they're really doing it right. Uh, and then finally, I'll, I'll just mention, they do a lot of great incentives to get you to stay. So, um, you know, they've got the book of the month club. And then also once you're there for a year, you get a tote bag. And this one is really smart because uh, not only does it give you a tote to carry your books around in, but it's also branding. So you're walking around and you're telling people about book of the month. So not only do I as a customer feel valued, but they've also got me doing their marketing for them. So um, all around, just a company doing a lot of great things to retain their customers. All right, so let's talk a little bit about some of the metrics um, that you should specifically look into as a subscription provider. So when you're looking at your voluntary churn, there are a lot of metrics available to you. And in general, when you're working with um, when you're working with your customers, you want to think about, okay, what type of customer are they? If, they're, if you're working with B2B, and again, we talked about that being mission critical, you should really see high retention and low churn. Uh, on the flip side with B2C, you might see higher churn depending on the product. And um, that's okay as long as you constantly have that, that bucket being filled with new customers. If either of these metrics is really out of balance, that might signal to you that you have a problem with either your, um, your product itself or maybe your, your marketing re and retention strategies. So keep an eye on the comparison for your voluntary versus involuntary churn. Now we talked about this a little bit, I think Paul jumped, jumped the gun, um, but cohort analysis and really looking at that subscriber cliff. And so again, you know, take a look at your cohorts and see, you know, is it month six or maybe it's, you know, maybe it's month nine or, you know, what we see month zero is, is your trial not performing well. So um, keeping an eye on your trial conversion rates is another version of that subscriber cliff. If you're not seeing people make it out of that first month or that first trial period, it could tell you that you need to do more to message your value during that try before you buy period. Other things you can look at as well is um, plan performance. So typically with annual subscriptions, you will see higher churn and there's a number of reasons why, but uh, keep in mind that when you have annual customers, the longer you have their billing information on file, the easier it is to expire. So you want to have uh, good systems in place like using account updater, um, using retry logic. Um, with annual customers, they might have forgotten about the subscription. So sending them a reminder before it renews is, is a really good strategy. Whereas with monthly ones, you know, it's, it's a little more rapid. It's a little less of a chance for the customer to and I see, um, you know, some subscription companies will do an annual subscription where it automatically expires at the end of the year. And some will do an annual mm -hmm. where it will, you know, continue and renew, like you said. And I, I would imagine, like you just suggested, that churn is higher because they forget about it. 
they weren't ready for that. Another, you know, it's, it's typically a bigger charge, right? Cause it's an annual, um, yeah. do you recommend one more method over the other of doing an annual that expires and then giving them like suggesting that they hit the renewal pro or, you know, emailing to hit the renewal process, or do you recommend that automatic renewal? Yeah. Uh, so I think it's, you know, the automatic renewal is great okay. with the proper messaging. And we'll talk a little bit about that when we hit the uh, legalities section. But um, the key is, you know, communication. Yeah, that makes sense. Course, with anything, right. <laughs> um, and then, you know, we, we did talk a little bit about this too, but keep an eye on your cancellation process. Um, one of the companies that does this so well is Sling, right? Like if you're going in and you're trying to cancel your Dish digital subscription, um, they actually, you know, kind of put you through a multi-stage step and they're like, well, why is this? Is it the price? Is it, you're just not using it? Is it, you don't have the shows? So you're getting great data right there as a business. And then um, once you complete that, they're like, well, wait a minute, why don't you just pause? Like, can we, can we just take a break? So they put you through this multi-stage process that really makes you think about it, but it's still really easy to do. Um, they're still gathering data. So it's, it's a good yeah, experience. Yeah. And it's funny because sometimes as a consumer, it can be a little bit frustrating, you know, like I just, I just want to cancel, but oh, well, maybe, yeah, maybe right. that, you know, pausing isn't a bad option. And, and you get to that point versus the, I mean, there are subscription companies out there where you hit that, you know, you, you don't have, you can't find the cancel button. You can't find any way to get out of it. I ran into this with survey monkey the other day. I'm sorry, survey monkey, but it's time we should talk about this. I couldn't <laughs> find it. You know, the only option I could find was delete my account. Like, I don't want to delete it yet. I just don't want to renew next June. And I want to think about it and have more time, you know? And so just giving the consumer those choices, giving them those, those options and helping them map out kind of the thought process of what are the best plans for us to work together is a great way to approach it. Yeah. And it sounds like they kind of went, um, you know, slashed earth, you know, with you where it's like either you, you subscribe yeah. or like everything is deleted. Well, you don't want to lose all your I'm data paid until June. Well, yeah. So, um, you know, that yeah. definitely we should talk to them. <laughs> um, so, you know, when you're looking at your involuntary churn, there are some really key metrics and this is what I really geek out about with our customers. Um, I love looking at transaction decline rates. Um, so one of my favorite examples was I was working with a merchant in the UK who was launching a US based business and they came to me and they said, I have 80% decline rates. And it turns out it was because as a UK merchant, it was really common for them to have 3D secure on their transactions. But in the US at that point, it's getting a little more common now, um, but at that point, 3D secure just wasn't something used in the US. So as soon as they turned that off, their decline rate dropped down to like a more normal five to 6%. So often those transaction decline uh, rates, they're, you know, they're pretty, tough to dig through, but if you work with someone who knows the space and knows what patterns to look for, it can be really insightful into what's driving your yeah, involuntary churn. I think sometimes merchants, maybe newer merchants have a, a habit. This might be a little bit dated, but you know, turn off the CVV verification or the, the zip code verification because boy, it just lets those transactions fly through. You don't get as many people frustrated or failed, but you open yourself to a ton of fraud, right? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. You know, that's, that's another balance point. It's like, you know, do you open up your funnel and then risk that they're going to decline in a few months because of fraud or, or pain issues, or do you really narrow that funnel and validate your customers up front? So that's a balancing act that merchants can, can play with over time as they analyze those decline rates and those different error messages. Um, you know, some other things to think about are, you know, your transaction declines versus your invoice declines. So, um, you know, often I'll have someone come to me and say, oh my gosh, I had 3000 transactions decline this month. I'm like, okay, well, how many invoices failed? And it's like two. And that's because uh, when you're working with subscription business, you know, you're, you go to bill a customer and maybe at the point of renewal, they don't have any funds in their account. But, you know, customer companies like Recurly will retry that transaction. And so it may lead to, you know, more transactions. But as long as those invoices are getting collected on, that's the goal you want. You really want to make sure that, um, you know, if your, your invoice decline rate is really, really high, 
well, okay, that's maybe a problem. But as long as those invoices are getting paid, so what that means what is want. there's an invoice created for the transaction. And when the transaction runs, that invoice is being cleared. So even if you're seeing right. those transactions failing, if it's eventually hitting and running and that invoice is being cleared, then you're you're doing okay. It's just like you just explained, their credit card wasn't ready at the time or is pulling out of their bank account and they're overdrafting. Exactly. You know. and, and being smart about those retries. Um, some some companies out there will retry every single day. They'll just be like, okay, let's just brute force this and see if the customer has funds. You know, that's, that's definitely one approach, but uh, you will very quickly hit limits from the car brands. You know, they may only want you to retry eight times or 10 times. And if you, you know, retry, say every day starting on the third, you're probably missing a customer's payday. So um, making sure that you are working with a provider or um, you're retrying on, on a schedule that makes sense and that will actually have now What about, return. besides just retries, what about communication around that as well? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, very, have very, very open communication with your customers. So um, typically like with a B2C company, I might say, you know what, email your customer every three days for two weeks. Um, remind them constantly well that these retries are going on in the background. But for a B2B, you know, you might want to retry every week for three weeks um, because they get, you know, tend to finance people tend to get frustrated if they're like, yeah, I know, I know. It's just, it's going through the purchase order process or, or whatever. So um, again, that's an area where you can really tweak and see what works best for your audience. And I will point out that with, um, with Dunning and with involuntary churn, there is a point of diminishing return. So um, keep in mind that, you know, every time you retry these transactions, they cost you, you know, they cost maybe 10 cents or whatever interchange rates you're getting. And it's really important to look at your recovery rates over time. So again, looking at that transaction data to see, you know, after day 21, how many customers am I recovering? Should I really keep retrying if I'm only recovering $10? Maybe not. But I've also seen companies that want to have a retry for 90 days because there might be a $30,000 invoice they recover on day 89. So it's totally worth it for them. So knowing what it costs you to retry these transactions will also help you understand you know, how long you should retry for. And then at that point, you know, what do you do? Do you terminate their subscription and write it off as, as bad debt? Do you uh, leave the invoice active with the hope that they might come back? Do you leave their subscription active? These are all things you can do uh, to, you know, again, levers you can pull to optimize your uh, retention of your customers. So uh, here's a little bit of my plug for Recurly. So uh, before I joined Recurly, I was doing billing at a startup. We had a homegrown solution. And I literally had a tab for every single day of the week in an Excel spreadsheet, and it would list each customer who was billed on that day. And I would run a batch and, and have to manually follow up. And it was, I mean, it was horrible. It was every day I was doing this all day long. And so when Recurly was started, I was so excited to join because it automated all of this. Um, having uh, the ability to automatically communicate with customers and vary the settings. So you can have different settings for your automatic versus your manual invoices. So in general, that B2B versus B2C. Um, you know, you can give your customers a direct link to update their billing information. The worst thing you can do is put in your email and say, hey, to update your billing information, contact billing at whatever.com. Because what they're going to do is they're going to email you their credit card information, which is yeah, you don't something want you don't want, right? You don't want, but you don't want to have that. So, um, you know, a lot of services out there will have what, you know, Recurly calls a hosted account billing page. And it's, you know, page where they can securely enter their billing information and we will retry the transaction right then and there. And, you know, just keep that email short and sweet. Let them know they're past due, give them a link to update. The more junk you put in that email, the less likely they are to pay attention. And, you know, but again, having some really clear information in there in terms of cancellation, we'll talk a little bit about the legalities there, but uh, you have the ability to increase the frequency and the urgency as time goes on. So, you know, maybe in the beginning, it's a nice friendly email reminder, but maybe towards the end, it's like, 
hey, red alert, you're going to get shut down. Like, let's do this. Come on. Um, so having that ability to customize your Dunning emails is really important. Another area that's really successful is in-app messaging. So, um, you know, when a customer goes past you, is your billing tool able to give you um, alerts for your system? So in Recurly, we have webhooks, we have API calls, and um, that allows a merchant to have a lot of options in terms of notifying their customers outside of email. Um, so one of the best examples I had was uh, working with a merchant who had a Gmail plugin. And so whenever a customer went past due, they used Recurly's webhooks and they put an alert, this huge banner across the top of the customer screen. So the customer's like logging in, actively using the product and they're like, whoa, I'm past due. And that banner had a very clear cancel and billing information update link. And then they would use webhooks again to notify their system when they were paid in full and, and take the banner down. That customer had some of the best recovery rates I've ever seen because they very successfully implemented in app messaging. And you can really use those same functionalities to do things like SMS messaging um, and making sure that there's a really clear way to notify your customers, you know, in that phone that we all have in our hands uh, that yeah, they have I a bet, payment issue. I mean, I heard a, I'm going to be making this up somewhat right now, but it's relative at least, you know, the typical person will see an email it takes about like 90 minutes to see an email versus nine seconds on SMS. Our phones are so glued to our hands today right. with, and, and we look for those or even, you know, millennials have a tendency to want to really clear out their text, that little bubble that says how many text, unread text messages you yeah. have versus emails just pile up all day. Uh, so I bet SMS can be yeah. extremely effective. Absolutely. Yeah. And just another way to communicate with your audience. All right. So here's where we get into legalities, which I know is not very exciting to a lot of people, but this is so important to think about, especially now. Um, subscription businesses are growing like crazy and uh, the legal changes around this are happening very rapidly and it's important to know what's going on. So the long and the short of it is, is you know, consider your risk factor. Retention is super important in a subscription business, but you don't want to prevent your customers from being able to exit if they really want to. So, um, you know, keep an eye on what's going on. And a couple things to consider is um, chargebacks suck. Like as someone who's had to deal with chargebacks, this is an antiquated process that takes a ton of time. Um, the graphic on the right here just kind of shows like how many steps are involved, how much time it takes. So if a customer is not able to get a refund from you, they're gonna go through this process, which not only costs you time, but it costs you a lot of money. Um, the bank is going to forcibly take these funds from you. And sometimes this even happens before the chargeback notification comes in the mail. I mean, it's just, you know, preventing chargebacks is going to be key for your business. And um, I'll actually jump back here a little bit. Um, so preventing chargebacks is really key to your business because if you, if you uh, experience a certain percentage of chargebacks, in your overall transaction volume, you could be shut down by your merchant bank account processor. So you could just stop processing for all of your customers. You could um, have to get a high risk merchant account fee that has um, some rolling reserves and things like that. So chargebacks are, are not something you wanna see. And if you are getting a lot of chargebacks, I would encourage you to take a look at your cancellation pro uh, policies and see what you can do there. Um, so again, you know, there are a lot of rules and laws that are coming into play because, you know, we're seeing increases in chargebacks because we're seeing difficulties in cancellation. And one of the federal rules out there is this ROSCA rule, which um, really defines pretty much the guidelines for how to communicate with your customers. And they really talk about being clear and conspicuous in terms of what is going on, um, informed consent, basically opt-in to renewals, especially as we talked about with annual renewals, make sure you're, you're covered by sending that renewal reminder, and this simple mechanism to stop recurring charges. These are very, very broad terms, but um, they're, they're very easy to comply with if you need to.
And just giving one sort of state regulation, and again, this very much echoes ROSCA, which is, you know, very clear and conspicuous display of service terms, affirmative consent or opt-in, um, giving them information about your terms and your cancellation policy, and then giving clear contact information. These are not hard things to do. Um, they're very, very easy to include in your website, in your emails, anywhere you need to put it, and it will keep you on the right side. Of I'm sure a models. lot of the merchants out there are going, oh, California. You know, but on the flip side, California is leading the charge in the way that probably the rest of the country is going to go and should go. And they're just some basic fundamental things that we should all be doing to be good to our customers out there, right? Absolutely. And, and more and more states are developing yeah. laws like this. So um, even if you're not in California, it, yeah. it, I think it will we're, happen soon. Merchants probably are getting frustrated as you're seeing a lot of these, um, I call them ambulance chaser type lawsuits, but a lot of these lawsuits that are popping up where they're, you know, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars settlements because they didn't do one thing on their site. And and so they're you know, just paying attention to those things and paying attention to the laws and really educating yourself and understanding, you know, like like you're showing here, what what things should we be looking at will help prevent that from happening and prevent that from coming into play. And if you look at each of these laws, uh, you know, they're they're pages long. But what it basically comes down to is, you know, don't be a jerk, right? Don't prevent your customers from being able to cancel. Be upfront about what you're doing. Um, these are not challenging requirements as long as you're, you know, yeah. on the yeah, up and right. up with your customers. I always worry when a customer doesn't want to send, you know, invoice emails or they kind of want to hide their cancellation because it just means pain yeah. down the end. So... In summary, I mean, I know I've thrown a lot of data at you, but um, what's great about all of this is you don't have to make all of these changes at once. If you're not doing these today or you're not clear on what you're doing today, don't make a lot of changes at once because then you won't know what is driving change. Uh, my recommendation is always to tweak and then review. So, you know, maybe you're not retrying your transactions for, uh, maybe today you're retrying your transactions for three days maybe expand it out to seven and then 21, or you can really tweak these things over time. And if you have a good analytic system, you can measure the outcomes and um, try to keep your customers happy. So, you know, everything we've talked about here, good retention strategies, good email reminders, um, good logic for retrying your transactions. These are the things that are gonna keep your customers with you and also going to have your customers be your best advocate. All right, well, thank you everyone for joining this workshop today. And this is definitely something I love to talk to different companies about. So uh, Paul, where can they go to continue the conversation? Yeah, absolutely, Rachel. Uh, thanks so much for being here and sharing this amazing knowledge. We're gonna continue the conversation over in the Sub to Slack channel. If you're a Sub to member, you may already be involved in it. If not, we sent a link out in the email about the webinar of how you can join to continue the conversation over at that. Uh, sub to Slack channel. We're going to be in hashtag recurly there talking more about this. And then, uh, you know, we'd love to, you know, keep talking. So you can reach out to Rachel, you can reach out to myself anytime. Uh, lots of ways, great ways to find us, find us on LinkedIn, find us throughout all the different social channels. And uh, thank you so much for being here and being part of this, Rachel. It's, it's awesome. Oh, thank you. All right. We'll talk to you guys more soon.